Well, I'd like to welcome everybody to today's webinar where we're going to be talking about home recording for elevating your skills and setup for making hit recordings at home. I'm Andrew Lanhorst, and I'm joined today by, uh, by my friend, Will Bennett. How's it going, y'all? And uh, again, we're basically going to be going over the stuff that you need to know and, you know, what you really want to be thinking about and considering for, for when you're going to be recording at home. Um, We'll just wait a couple more minutes here to allow some more people to file in. So go ahead and grab yourself a beverage or a snack um, and uh, we'll get started in a few moments. So again, we're talking about home recording and home recording is obviously it's an interesting one because it's so kind of situational based, you know, you can be do you can do so many different things with it. Um, you know, you can sort of have so many different goals, whether, you know, you're recording just for demo purposes or you're actually making records or anything like that. There's a lot that, uh, there's a lot that you can do with it. And so that's what we're gonna talk about today. So again, my name is Andrew Landhorst. I'm the assistant editor at NWC and I am joined by Will Owen Bennett. Uh, Will, you wanna talk a bit, a bit about your own background? Sure. Um, so I'm, uh, you know, musician, audio engineer, producer. Um, I grew up in grew up in New York City and went up to Montreal uh, to uh, study at McGill. And I did, uh, you know, a classical percussion performance degree at McGill, and then went to do their uh, like audio engineering master's degree, um, and then worked in Montreal for a bit. And I've uh, just now kind of moved back to New York this past December. Um, but I, you know, I've, uh, the beauty of, well, one of the, my favorite parts of Montreal was the fact that I was able to have like a decent amount of space in the apartment. So I always had a home studio that I would kind of use as a combination of a mixing room, as well as a, a small recording space. Um, and so I was able to, you know, have vocalists and, and, uh, rappers come out to, uh, you know, record vocals in my place and sort of made my way over to, uh, uh, eventually started connecting with um, Backwash and an album that we made last year in my apartment in Montreal uh, ended up winning the Polaris Prize this past year. So it's kind of, um, so, I mean, it was hugely amazing that it was something that, you know, I, I recorded and mixed in my house, um, you know, most of the time sipping on coffee and in pajama pants on like a Saturday morning and it ended up being the, uh, a, a, a national prize winning record. So, you know, uh, um, so yeah, so I mean, that's, that's, uh, you know, I, I, I don't only work in with hip hop, I've worked with, uh, you know, a lot of jazz musicians as well, and uh, indie rock and um, uh, pop musicians as well. So I sort of have uh, some and uh, some uh, uh, experience kind of with, uh, with whatever genre may be thrust my way. Yeah, so there you get, there you have it again. Congrats on the uh, the Polaris. But yeah, so again, that's just goes to show you again, you can make you can make award winning you can, you know, you can make any record you want to make at home. You don't need to, you don't need to go to a studio to do it necessarily. Before we continue, um, we'll actually start by doing a little bit of a poll here. And uh, so I'm going to go ahead and ask just uh, where is where's everybody from so far? That should come up in just a moment. You can go ahead and answer that. Oh, Atlanta, that's pretty cool. Right. A lot of Ontario. Cool, few out, few out west, a couple in the States, few in the Maritimes. Cool. That's cool to, cool to, cool to see some people from the States and from, from all throughout the country. That's awesome. So, First things first, just to break down what we're actually going to be talking about today. Um, the kind of three things that we're mainly going to be touching on are A, considerations for your room itself, um, B, recording equipment and, you know, the actual tools of the trade, and then three is going to be recording techniques as far as, you know, the actual skill set and, and, almost the brains behind behind recording and sort of the processes there. So we'll start with room considerations, right? 
The thing, the biggest problem with people's rooms when they're recording, you know, is usually that there's, they're too reflective. There's noise caused by, by sound bouncing off the walls, bouncing off of, you know, various materials and whatnot that cause just nasty stuff to get back into your mic and ultimately ruins your recordings. And why this is not a good thing is that, you know, usually when you're tracking, you're going to want to have to mix that later and you want as dry a signal as you can get so that you can process it however you need to. Um, and, you know, so that it's, it's just exists as its own thing, right? It's not, it's not, it doesn't already have an effect on it. Of course, you can get creative and do things, you know, like purposely recording with, with extra reverb behind your vocals, but generally you don't want to do that. Your room needs, wants to be nice and dead. Uh, Will, you want to elaborate? Yeah, absolutely. So, so part of the, really the, the consideration is you want to be able to have control um, in a mixing stage. So, you know, if you have, um, you know, whatever you kind of, whatever the sound ends up sounding like when you're starting to record, you're going to get stuck with it. So now that might be okay. So if it's something where it's like, you know, you want, this, you know, say you're recording an acoustic guitar, or say you're recording, um, you know, even a, even a singer, like you're recording some backup vocals, if you want it to be a little bit roomier in the mix, that's okay. The problem is you've made that decision at the recording stage, um, if that's just sort of whatever your room sounds like. The other uh, big issue with um, having your room not really be treated is that rooms are often have extremely uneven um, uh, sort of frequency response in terms of the way that their reverb uh, sort of like manifests, um, especially given the fact that we're generally all living in uh, rectangular rooms. So like one of the things to really, the, in, in an ideal recording space, you would have uh, no parallel walls whatsoever, because what happens with uh, something with a parallel wall is you have sound that travels from one end of the wall back to the other, other end of the wall, and it creates what we call a standing wave, which ends up being a resonance at a certain frequency. So what that basically sounds like is it sounds like, um, uh, basically what happens is the sound will take longer to decay at that frequency. And then what you end up with is, you know, let's say you're recording vocals in a room and you end up with certain notes or certain frequencies that are gonna pop out of the texture. And it's gonna yeah. really be a nightmare when, once you're dealing with mixing. Um, so the key is not just to like, you know, kind of blanket, uh, dead in your room. The key is to also think about, um, you know, what frequencies are you deadening and, and how, how you can sort of get something to be relatively balanced. Yeah, absolutely. And you know, that, that's why, you know, when you go into recording studios and you see like the control rooms are always some sort of weird, like trapezoidal thing or interesting shapes and ratios but you know for unfortunately because you know we're recording at home so obviously unless you can just build a whole new room and put new walls up you're kind of stuck with the geography or the uh yeah, the geography i suppose that you have right so in that case you know well you can really get you know get super molecular with it and consider things like diffusers and again i've got the mentioning professional ac acoustic treatment here the first thing that you're gonna really wanna just try to do again is eliminate reflections. Um, I did just see in the chat a question about a soundproof room versus a non-soundproof room. It's important to make the distinction that soundproofing and acoustic treatment are not the same thing. Yeah, yeah soundproofing is sort of the, uh, is stopping sound from escaping the room, whereas acoustic, acoustic treatment is dealing with the sound within the room. Yeah, that's a-, um, a an important and, distinction to make there. Go ahead. Yeah, and another thing, I mean, this is sort of getting into the second the second point, but I know you, you meant, because uh, you mentioned diffusion, um, and uh, this is sort of getting into the sort of idea of like professional acoustic treatment, because you can actually, uh, I mean, you can build your own diffusers, but you can even have thing, something like a bookcase is actually a, a relatively effective uh, diffuser. Um, so if you have a bookcase, the fact anything uh, like what diffusion basically is, is it sort of scatters uh, the sound wave. So it makes it so that it creates a bunch of different angles so that when the, when sound hits it, it'll then kind of disperse in random directions. 
Um, so something like a bookcase is actually really effective for this because there's going to be so many different little nooks and crannies and uneven um, sort of, uh, it's going to be such an uneven surface that as the sound reaches the bookcase, it's then going to be scattered in all of these random directions. So even something like diffusion, you know, you don't have to go and buy, uh, you know, a big diffuser that's usually like, they're usually super expensive. You don't really need to buy that. You could actually have a fairly decent diffuser with a bookcase that you then, you know, stack in a certain way that's, that becomes relatively effective. Yeah, exactly. And, uh, you know, that kind of leads me down, down the path that I wanted to go on, which is basically, you know, when considering, you know, treating your room at first, you can really almost sort of get to a good, good spot, you know, just sort of with household objects, you know, if you can basically passive absorption kind of is something that's a product of generally just mostly just soft and soft and absorbent kind of materials. So, you know, that's why, you know, you look up on the walls at, at studios, or even if you look at, uh, look in Will's space now, you know, you can, yeah, Will talk yeah. for a sec, so you pop up on the screen. Right, oh yeah, right, exactly. I guess that's the, the, the key here. So yeah, so, so uh, uh, essentially pa what passive absorption is, so I just saw in the chat, there's something like a couch. Uh, a couch is actually something that is effective. Um, even humans, we ourselves are mm -hmm. absorbers. Um, but the basic idea is of passive absorption is that it's something that physically impedes uh, uh, the sound, the air molecules from uh, moving as much as they as much as they can. So, um, you know, so these panels I actually have built myself. Um, I, it's like my second round of panel building, so I've been I, I've kind of gotten a little bit better at it. Um, but it's filled with essentially uh, insulation. Um, so something, something like, so this is kind of like, this is pretty much what you would buy um, for something like that, uh, uh, first for like a passive absorber. Now, there are other things that you can use, you know, something like a, if you have a foam mattress, something like that would yeah, actually- mattresses are great. Yeah, the, I mean, the key is, you know, you, you, the one thing about the spring mattress is that it may not be filled with uh, material. And what you want is something that is really just filled with material. And it is yeah. open at both sides, like both on the front side and the back side. There, yeah, like for example, for for a long while in in my own space, I kind of built a vocal booth out of old camper mattresses mm -hmm. that were just just literally mattress just full of foam, just stick two of them up in the corner, and that leads me to, uh, or actually, just before I go move on, I did see that yeah in in the chat too. Quilts are awesome. Quilts are really really good. Mm -hmm. Now, the one yeah. thing to keep in mind when uh, uh, is that the thickness of the material will determine how low of a frequency uh, you will be able to absorb. Mm -hmm. So something that is much thinner um, is that only gonna, really going to be absorbing high frequencies. And then something that's actually much thicker is actually going to start to begin to, to absorb low frequencies. Um, unfortunately, the, you know, the, um, the difference in the difference between high frequencies and low frequencies is fairly massive. I mean, if you go to like a mastering studio, they have something like five to six feet of absorption in all of the walls. Now that's obviously, we can't really, uh, we can't, that's not really possible for most of us, but if you can get something that's like, um, you know, four to eight inches, those will usually do you very, very well compared to something that's like, just super thin or even a thicker blanket might do something, would do something better than, uh, uh, you know, just a really very small, thin piece of uh, piece of fabric. Yeah. As far as, you know, distribution of, of what you're putting up on the walls. And again, you know, if you, furniture in there is great, you know, if you got, uh, you know, if you got cats or dogs, you know, if you pile them all into your room and they're going to help too. <laughs> Right. Um, but you want to kind of, you know, evenly distribute it like, well, if you want to do a quick little pan around of actually showing of how you, where you've got all of the pads up on the wall. Sure. Absolutely. So I have, a, so I have, you know, these are the, the thickest ones that I have are kind of behind the speakers. These ones are, uh, these are each eight inches. Then this one and this one are both uh, four inches. And then I have over here, I have another four inch one kind of in the corner there. I've got then I have two two inch ones over here on the window there and kind of just here behind the door. 
um, my little spinny rig here that's kind of proud of actually. Sweet. Yeah, it's good. Um, but yeah, so that's, that's essentially the, uh, uh, you know, that's kind of what I've got for now. I, I, I also have, um, you know, I'm still working my way into this room. So I'm probably going to add a little bit of um, like from some foam or something, because I may have uh, something that we, something you call flutter echo. Um, so something that's like, you know, the sound is really bouncing across two walls and it sounds like a spring. Um, I, you may have heard that at some point, but that's, that's what you call a flutter echo. So with that, you really just need some absorber to kind of catch that. Mm -hmm. Now, the, the next point that I get to uh, saying that the deadest part of the room should be behind the performer to catch late reflections. This is specifically in a lot of in a lot of cases, like in a sort of a booth context, if you're setting up a booth, a lot of times you, you see kind of, you know, people who are recording who aren't familiar with these types of principles, you know, the old setting up in a closet or something or performing into just, you know, singing into the absorptive material. It's actually kind of the other way around. Do you want to perform out into the room and have your reflective stuff behind you so that you're getting reflections that are caught from going into the mic, right? If, if, if you're performing, say, into a corner, you're going, to be, you're going to be singing and then you're, the signal or the sound is going to bounce off of the stuff in front of you, come to the walls behind you, and then hit the capsule of the microphone. So to avoid that, you actually want to turn around and perform into the open space. And so that, you know, you'll get your reflections caught by, you know, some of the other stuff throughout the room. But more importantly, as it bounces back to you, it'll be, it'll catch a lot of the sort of extraneous stuff from actually hitting your microphone, which is, again, that's the big cause of, you know, of extraneous noise and stuff in your recordings is those reflections coming back to the capsule. Um, and I, so say, I, I, do wanna hop, I do wanna hop in for a second. Yeah, go for uh, it. There's something that Neil said in the chat that I think is, is um, something to, to definitely to be addressed because the, because um, essentially, because that is, that I think that that is a consideration, you know, when they have like the vocal, vocal shields, basically what he was saying was that it's potentially singing into absorption might absorb a lot of the voice, which would then stop the voice from then exciting the room in the first place. Mm -hmm. uh, now, I think there's something to be said for that. But again, I think the key is to think about where, you know, this, your specific room that you're in and where, you know, the source of your reflections might be. Um, yeah. You know, for example, I'm in this really tiny room, right? So if I have someone singing away from the mic, you know, they're going to be singing kind of into a wall, which is then, and the room is small enough where like, you know, the, the sound is going to be bouncing it out enough quickly where, you know, I might actually want to set them up so that they're singing into a large absorber. Yeah, it's a rule of thumb. Like if you're a bigger mm -hmm. space, like it definitely it depends on your space. Exactly. In general, a larger space, that's definitely the way to do it because there's going to be more, um, there's, it's because there's more volume in the room, there's going to be more reflections. So there's a lot more likely that um, basically places are going to be, you know, a, a, a like there's going to be a bunch of reflections that are sort of swimming around the room and then are going to come into the mic. Yeah. Um, the other thing to consider too, though, is like as far as performing in, like directly into the, into the absorption is that sometimes you can actually swing it too far the other way and it'll just result in a super dead, boring recording. And you don't always want that either. You know, sometimes you want to keep a little bit of the excitement in there. But again, that, that's more subjective. And again, it's more about just understanding, you know, these are things to think about rather than just, you know, slapping a mic down somewhere and trying it out. You know, experiment with your room, try different spots as far as where you can set up. But yeah, ideally, you know, consider the size of the room, consider the geometry of the room and, you know, then kind of make your decision that way. But just, just always keep in mind that again, the the room really is the first part of what's going to dictate the sound of your recordings. Mm -hmm. And that's something that is, it's a misconsideration a lot of times, which is why I wanted to cover this first. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Uh -huh. um, another thing that, you know, another thing to think about is, you know, how, uh, uh, especially when you're dealing with something like the voice is really like, um, if you can get a thicker absorber, um, something like that, that would actually be a really good, 
uh, that, that would be much better than any type of thin absorber thing. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, for example, I have this panel that's kind of directly over here. Um, this is like a four inch panel. You know, in this room, I would probably set up a mic and have someone kind of, you know, uh, and have a, a, a singer basically be singing into, the, into that panel. Um, somewhat. That would basically be the way it is because I know that that panel is actually a little bit, is thick enough where it's going to be absorbing enough of uh, the singer's voice where I'm not going to be dealing with weird resonances or different things. Mm -hmm. like that. Yeah. Always take the opportunity, like when you're kind of like, you know, trying stuff for the first time or, you know, the, it's your first time liking something up again, just experiment with different spots and see what works. But yeah, generally the bigger, the bigger space you're in, Obviously, that's going to make it more reflective, but then at the same time, it's going to make a less chance of getting the weird flutter echoes and stuff like that. Right. And then also like a bigger in a larger space, you can rely less on absorption and a little bit more on diffusion. Yeah. Because um, the keys, you know, I mean, yeah, I mean, just in general, you know, what you want is you want any reflections or any, you know, room sound to be as different as possible from the direct sound. Yeah. So that could be through, through time or something like that, or that could be through, I mean, really it would just be through time. So that would be kind of like just dealing with those like really first reflections that show up in the microphone um, and try to get those out of the way. And then the rest of it is just sort of balancing it so that nothing gets really stuck at a certain frequency. Yeah. Uh, but, all right, cool. So yeah. before we move on to the next thing, Will, do you want to pull up your, uh, your drawing? I do. Um, so, I have a, a drawing of kind of what this space is right now. Um, let me kind of grab this real quick. <clears throat> so this is a drawing of kind of, of, of literally the room that I am currently in. Um, let me see if I can get this so that it's a little bit, I can see more of it. All right. So this is, this is, yeah, this is the room that I'm currently in. Um, if uh, my, sort of my, you can kind of also see my photo there. So you can see that I have my two eight inch uh, bass traps kind of here. There's a little cutout that I'm, is being hidden by my, the bass trap that's to my left um, right here. But these are both eight inches and they're two uh, acoustic panels that are stacked on one another. Um, again, like this, you know, my room is, is more of a mixing room. So it's not so much, it's, it's basically, I'm kind of trying to treat it mostly for um, mixing and because it's a small enough room, it's basically going to be treated enough for uh, me to be able to record someone with the tiny amount of space that I have. Um, but basically when I'm considering the, the, the room here, the first thing to think about is what are my room dimensions? Um, so right now my room is basically like six foot 11 by 12 feet. And then I have uh, like eight foot three ceilings. Um, so one of the things I see, like Neil mentions there, that there's calculators online. Um, one of them is uh, uh, if you look up like AMROC room mode calculator, um, that's, what I, that's one that I use all the time and that one's really fantastic. And what you can do is you can plug in the dimensions of your room and it can basically give you an overview of kind of where are the problem spots going to be. Um, now, again, like this is going to be, it's going to be a general sort of situation because it's not, you know, there's going to be always going to be little, you know, you're never going to be living in this perfect cube box thing with absolutely no, you know, windows or no, um, you know, you know, perfectly reflective material, et cetera. But it's a good place to start of sort of like, this is where it's possible to kind of search for these sorts of things. Um, so the first thing, so the, the first thing to think about uh, is also like choosing a room that you're going to be recording in. If you have, you know, a house where you have multiple options, or if you know, it's like sort of, you know, which which room am I going to actually place myself in? Um, so the one thing to keep in mind is you want to avoid cubic rooms as much as possible. Um, essentially, as much uh, once you have a cubic room, that means that uh, essentially you're going to have a standing wave. So that's really what you're considering when you're considering like um, kind of room acoustics. Um, when you're dealing with room acoustics, uh, what you're trying to avoid is a standing wave. So for example, you know, I might, you know, uh, a standing wave is going to be sort of, you know, a boosted frequency 
whose wavelength is the exact length of one of the dimensions of your room. So there's going to be a low frequency whose they, they sound wavelength. Terrible. You don't want them. Exactly. So it's basically going to be kind of like a kind of thing that you're that you know uh, that is going to basically screw up a lot of your recording, right? Um, so the problem with the cubic room is that you have, uh, because it's all dictated by the dimensions of your room, when you have a cubic room, then what you can, what you have to do, basically what you're dealing with is, you know, all sides that are reinforcing this one frequency. Um, so it's just going to be a little bit more difficult. So if you, if you have a cubic room, what you may need to do is really focus on that one frequency or kind of really try to deal with that one frequency as much as you possibly can. Um, another option could be to, you know, figure out a way to, you know, build an extra uh, a wall or build a, you know, a large, you know, baffle that can kind of make one of the dimensions of your room a little bit smaller. Um, but so that was one of the things that I'm thinking, thinking about Essentially with this, especially, you know, I'm mostly, again, I'm designing this room as kind of a mixing room, but the key is I'm dealing with a re long rectangular room. I generally want my, um, uh, you know, my speakers to be firing down the long side of the room. Um, the reason for that is that it means that the reflection off of the back wall, which is kind of behind where the camera is now, is going to then be further away from my ears. Um, and the way I'm kind of designing this is that I have, you know, these base traps here across the corners because that allows for I'm basically going to have more base absorption there. I have three four inch panels that are catching my first reflection. There is going to be one on the ceiling. I saw that in the, in the, in the chat, someone was asking about, um, I still have to mount one on the ceiling, but uh, I, there will be one on the ceiling. I have my four inch panel here for uh, you know, and this is where my microphone is going to go for this kind of little recording spot. I have this two inch panel to kind of, you know, cover the thing. And I have a two inch panel to kind of cover the back wall. So this is basically kind of how I've done my room. Cool. Yeah. Yeah. That's, all. that's awesome. Like, and yeah, so again, this is, this is definitely a very, you know, for, for everyone in, in the chat, it's good to know that, you know, this is definitely a more, you know, really kind of going all in example, but these are just, you know, the things that you can think about. And <clears throat> again, just keep your keep your ears open and, and, you know, sort of just listen for any kind of anomalies that you may may get. But uh, anyway, we'll uh, we'll move on and we're going to talk about equipment now. And so basically, you know, when it comes to when it comes to the actual equipment, right? It's very much a, you know, start with just what you need and understand what you need. And the, so just consider, you know, what are you actually planning to record? How many inputs do you need? You know, if you're just wanting to record vocals or like, you know, acoustic guitar or anything like that, you, you might, you'll probably only need one or two mics. Um, if you want to set up for drums, you're going to need a lot of mics. You're going to need an interface with a lot of inputs, those types of things. So just make sure that you're considering that. Um, as far as microphones go, um, ideally you wanna get yourself at least one like serious workhorse, um, but then you wanna give yourself, if you can, a, a couple of other options. And I say, see uh, condenser versus dynamic there, which are basically you know two different types of microphones, the two kind of most popular. Uh, Will, do you wanna, quickly break down the difference? Yeah, so a, um, uh, uh, well, the first thing I think, I think about is, so a, a dynamic microphone is something like an SM57 or an SM58. It's usually what you'll see singers singing into on a con concert stages or something like that. Um, it's, it, when you're talking about condenser versus dynamic, it has to do with the way that uh, the microphone functions. Yeah. A dynamic microphone is essentially the opposite of a speaker. It's basically, there is a, you know, mag uh, a piece of wire that's wrapped around a diaphragm that's within a magnet. As the diaphragm moves back and forth, it creates a signal via the wire moving through the magnet, and then it, you know, becomes a, a sound. Now, a condenser microphone is something that is, uh, um, it's basically a, you know, a small diaphragm that is, uh, has an electric charge that's against yeah. the back pay, you know, it's whatever, but the main consideration when you're dealing with condenser versus dynamic microphones, one thing to really consider is that 
condenser Sense. microphones are always going to have um, a much wider polar pattern, basically yeah. a wider pickup as opposed to a dynamic microphone. Yeah, and uh, condensers too tend to be more sensitive because they're actually utilizing an electric charge, whereas dynamics, um, again, they're working based on sort of kinetic energy. Right. Whereas condensers actually require power that will come from your interface using phantom power, um, which is a plus 48 volt charge. Um, and then moving moving ahead, headphones and speakers, obviously you want to, um, starting out, you know, obviously you want to, Generally, if you can get yourself a good pair of studio monitor, uh, studio monitors and studio monitoring headphones, but for for starting out, headphones are actually going to be a little bit more of a priority for recording, so you're not having to deal with bleed from your speakers. Um, that's that's an important thing, and then uh, yeah, don't forget to budget for stands, cables, and peripherals. That's like one of the most annoying things is you're like, you know, I got my interface, I got my microphone. I don't have, you know, I don't have stands. I don't have cables. I don't have a pop filter. These are all stupid little things that I forgot to get. You don't want to find yourself in that situation. Make sure, make sure you're getting those things and accounting for and budgeting for those before you're going to pick up your gear. And then as far as software goes, there's you know a bunch of different options as far as, as DAWs or digital audio workstations, or to simplify that even further, recording software, right? Um, I'm personally a Logic Pro guy. Uh, Will, I you use Pro Tools or what? Yeah, I use Pro Tools. I also, I mean, I use Pro Tools in, uh, and also Ableton as well. Okay, cool. Yeah. Um, as far as that goes, like if you're, if you're a beginner and you're on Mac, like GarageBand is actually a great place to start. Um, there's a million choices here. Ideally, you can just kind of take a look, see what you can find and pick what you find is the best fit for you. Um, they all do the same. They all do the same thing, essentially. It's just, you know, laid out a slightly different way. Um, all right. But yeah, as far as the equipment goes, like, you know, the, the main thing you're going to need, like, is the interface. First of all, you know, that's the interface is what actually is kind of the hub of your studio. That's where your microphones go in and your speakers and headphones and stuff go out. Uh, the one that you see everybody use and is kind of like the, you know, the sort of ubiquitous kind of beginner or not beginner, but getting started interface is the Focusrite 2i2. Um, another one is would be like the Audient ID14. Um, these are all really good options because they're affordable and you know they come with two mic preamps so that you've got you know two inputs and that covers you for already pretty much everything except drums or you know slightly more more fancy uh, you know more fancy setups so that's a great place to start and you can do pretty much anything you need need to do there you can you know you can upgrade a little bit further and get into stuff like the audience ID44 or whatever for more inputs, but the interface is the most, is the hub of your studio. And that's the thing that you're going to want to focus on first, as far as your equipment and then microphones and then your peripherals. <clears throat> um, just real quick, we'll take a couple questions in chat, uh, especially like having to do with, uh, with the equipment and whatnot. And we'll expand a little bit more on this as we move forward too, but. Yeah, okay. So as far as interface brands, again, so we've got like, again, Focusrite is one of the one of the big ones, Audient is another, uh, Steinberg, and then you've got like ART Pro, and then as the higher level, you've got uh, stuff like Apogee or uh, Universal Audio. Um, there, there's or then like Black Lion, the Revolution 2x2 is a new one that just came out. That's really good. Um, as far as USB mics, they're okay, but they're generally, they'll work, but they just require some extra finesse because they don't have actual preamps on them. Mm. Uh, yeah, sort of like an interface plus a mic in one. So the only thing about that is that you know, for it to be still affordable, it, they, you kind of have to make some compromises with the different pieces of equipment. 
you know, it, it, it can work, you know what I mean? Like it, it can be something like, if that's what you have, you can definitely use that for sure. Yeah. My uh, first, but my if you were, yeah, if you were going to make a purchase, I would probably say get a, a separate interface and microphone. Yeah. Because that just gives you so much more control mm. and just, just in general, it's, it's going to yield some better results. Ooh, ISO pads for monitors on a desk. It, they help. I prefer stands just in general, if you have the space, but. I, I, I would say the same thing. I mean, I have ISO pads on these stands as yeah. well, but the key is you want to decouple the vibration of the speaker from your desk. Yeah. Uh, and that's, and that's essentially what those ISO pads will do is they'll sort of, you know, susp like suspend your speakers so that you're not like feeling the vibrations on the desk and it's not causing other things to rumble. Yeah. Oh yeah, actually that's a good good shout there, Chris. The SSL, the new SSL2 interfaces are also a great option. Mm. Uh, all right, moving forward. So we're gonna talk about some actual techniques now. So, you know, mic choice and placement relative to the source. Um, when I say mic choice, obviously, you know, if you're, if you're not dealing with a whole big old mic locker and let's say you've just got, you know, one condenser on hand and one dynamic on hand, um, you know, which mic, the microphone and the microphone type that you choose are going to start affecting the sound of your recording right at the mic itself. So, because um, every, every microphone has its own sort of characteristics and it had their own sound. And then obviously, uh, as such, the way that they're going to respond based on where they're placed relative to an instrument is going to change drastically. Um, so this is, this is where it really, where the engineering starts to pick up, right? Where whenever you're miking something up for the first time, you don't want to just arbitrarily throw the mic down on something and call it a day. You want to take the time to, you know, be very deliberate about where you're placing your mics. Um, and so, you know, that could involve, you know, if you're just, if it's just you by yourself, that can involve, you know, doing a few practice takes and just doing a few different spots as far as like, you know, if you're doing acoustic guitar, uh, starting like, you know, maybe six feet away from the mic. And generally like, I like having, having it pointed around like between the top of the body and the 12th fret. Um, so it's not too boomy, but it's also not too bright. But things like that, you always want to experiment with your mic, mic placement. And I, like it says, don't be afraid to try different approaches. Um, use pre-fader metering in your DAW. That's a feature that they'll have. And basically what it means is that the meters or the volume, the, the volume indicators in your recording software will show you the level of input that is going into them rather than the level that it's spitting out. And so that's going to allow you to accurately uh, see exactly the, the, the amplitude at which you are recording. Um, as a guideline, I tend to try to shoot between minus 10 and minus five dB, just because it's not, that's not too quiet, but it's not too loud. It gives adequate headroom for if things need to, you know, be, be super compressed or anything like that. It's just a, it's a healthy level, but at the same time, it's not too loud. And then as far as you, know, you want to be considerate of phase, phase is basically has to do with sort of the synchronization of sort of time in audio signals. If you have two microphones and uh, you're, they're recorded out of phase, that basically means the sound is arriving later from one signal than the other. And that causes things like comb filtering and just sort of weird uh, weird artifacts that you don't want. This is something that's more important to keep in mind when you're recording with multiple mics, um, but it is an ever-present sort of threat. Mm -hmm. I, can, uh, if I just want to jump in really quick on something yeah. like that. Um, so one thing to look in terms of uh, figuring out mic placement, um, you know, my favorite, like the, the way that I usually like to work, if, if, you know, whether or not I'm in the studio with an instrument or something like that, or if I'm in, you know, whatever space I'm in, with an instrument is I'll have them play. And I usually like to walk around the room and sort of really just be critically and listen and figure out like, okay, it sounds relatively good here. 
or it sounds relatively good here, relatively, you know, whatever my definition of what good is, depending on what my goal is with the sound of that instrument. Um, so that, that would be something that I would try to uh, recreate in, in your space, in your house. You know, one if, if it's your recording yourself, it's a little bit more difficult, but one thing you can do is you can, you know, place a microphone and put your headphones and kind of feed the, you know, what's coming out of the microphone into your headphones and play and really just listen and sort of move yourself around. And then you can get a sense mm -hmm. like, oh, I actually really like it if the mic, you know, I'm playing acoustic guitar and the mic's like right over here. I really like it if the mic's right here. Or if, you know, if you're playing violin or something, you could have a mic, yeah. something like that. Basically, the idea is that you are able to sort of listen and try out different placements. Um, yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. um, Kim, ask, to answer your question there, uh, he asked, or they asked, uh, for recording acoustic drums, any advantages in going with a mixing board with a built-in interface versus an interface like a Scarlet? Basically, the it's not really an advantage or disadvantage, although if you have a full mixer, the one thing that you can do there for is like processing on the way in, like you can EQ your signal or, you know, do gain reduction or, or anything like that, whatever it'll allow you to do on the, on the channel, on the mixer before it hits your recording. So if you want to do, you know, if you want to do some processing on the way in, like that is a, you know, could be an easy way to do drums, I, but uh, you know, it's mainly just a matter of control. You can, it gives you the option to kind of process things on the way in. But other than that, the actual recordings themselves, you know, I don't, you know, the converters might not be as great, but it depends on what the mixer, uh, mixer is that you have. Mm -hmm. So moving forward, you know, the important one, you know, is, is vocals. And uh, actually quickly, before we get into this one, uh, I'm just out of curiosity. We're going to run another poll real quick. Um, and I'm just going to see what uh, what all are you guys actually working on? What do you plan on doing with your recordings? You know, so are you you know, are you want to make actual actual you know full productions? Are you just doing demos for you know for later recordings? Or are you a songwriter just looking to kind of get your ideas down? <clears throat> Okay. Music licensing, licensing and performances. Okay, cool. Sweet. Okay. That's a cool, pretty, pretty fairly even distribution, but we got a lot of people making, just actually making records. That's awesome to see. That's great. So getting into vocal recording techniques, you want to consider both height and distance to the mic. And again, this also changes relative to the mic that you're actually using. Um, and so, you know, you don't always want to be like right up in it. That'll produce a different sound versus, you know, compared to, you know, I'll even demonstrate right now. You know, if I do this, things sound very different. And, you know, it probably sounds super boomy and stuff. That's called the proximity effect. Yeah, it's which also is, it's distorting as well. Yeah, you want to be careful about that. Um, but, uh, but yeah, you know, the tone changes as you move closer to and further from, and even as like vertically and horizontally. Um, I like to use the pop filter once I've established the right sound to basically create that sort of barrier for either myself, if I'm the performer or my, the client to basically say like, this is, this is how close you're going to get to the mic. You can't go closer than this. That's it. That's kind of just a little tip that, or a little trick that I like to use to keep people from getting too close. Yeah, that's a good one. Um, but I like to start with like, especially using condensers again, because they're a little bit more sensitive as far as just the, the, the input. Um, six inches from the capsule is a good, a good place to start. And I also tend not to have uh, like this performer's mouth lined right up with the capsule. I tend to aim a little bit lower somewhere between the mouth and sort of the chest. So as to capture more chest resonance rather than just air coming from the mouth. <clears throat> I, uh, that's just, that's one of my personal things. Well, I don't know how you like to do it, but. Yeah, that, I mean, the, the, the key with, if you have like a capsule like directly in front of the mouth, you're gonna get 
you know, a lot more sibilance, meaning like S sounds and like um, mouth noises and different things like that. Um, so if you get off that a little bit, that's a, then a little bit better. My, I usually like to go a little bit up um, so that they're kind of singing directly below the kind of grill of the okay. microphone. Um, but, you know, it, again, like it, it goes through the same process of like, you know, try it out, move it up a little bit, listen to it. No, it sounds, move it down a little bit. Oh, that sounds better if it's a little bit further down. You know, it, it really depends on the singer. It depends on the microphone. It depends on the room, mm -hmm. a lot of different sort of things. Um, one thing I also want to add is just to kind of just to extra explain proximity effect. Essentially, it's as you get closer to the microphone, it increases in low frequencies. Yeah. Um, so yeah, it's got uh, that point on the bottom there for the uh, for the readers. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Right. I, I see that there. Right. So the, the basic idea, um, you know, and that might be a sound that you want, especially if you really want it to sound like close and intimate. Mm. But a lot of times, it you know, it's something that you're you like if you're, you're going to cut it out close, anyway. Yeah, you might end up cutting it out anyway. Um, and it, so generally, it's like you. The, the key is you really don't want to get too close. Yeah, to the microphone. Yeah, that's it's just just keep it in mind. Again, again, like Will said, sometimes you want to get that for a stylistic effect, which is cool. Go for it, but just always keep it in mind. Mm -hmm. And you know, that's the same with so many of these things. Like, you, none of this is necessarily gospel. It's just, you know, you want to think like an engineer. You want to understand the thought processes behind, you know, behind these things rather than just kind of arbitrarily doing the process without understanding the thinking behind it. Um, so this is kind of some stuff that we briefly touched on. So this is a, acoustic sources. So these are going to be things like, you know, your acoustic guitars or, you know, hand percussion or violins, things like that. Condenser mics are usually going to be ideal for these just because of the level of detail and because they're going to pick up a little bit of a, a wider range due to their, uh, their, their pickup pattern. But uh, as well, you want to capture with these types of things, you want to capture the whole instrument. Um, the example that I use here would be acoustic guitar, right? You don't want to stick it like right up close on the sound hole because all you're going to be getting if you're recording the sound hole of an acoustic guitar, like two inches away, is just basically. Right. It's just going to be big, boomy noise. It's not going to really sound like acoustic guitar. So, you know, you want to move further away, give, sp give space for the instrument and its sound to actually propagate before, before it hits the mic. Um, but on super, super loud stuff, um, you know, uh, like drums, for example, you know, kick drum, snare drum, dynamic mics are going to be the way to go there in most cases. Or if you can, if you can spare it, say both a dynamic and a condenser. But uh, yeah, for acoustic sources, again, it consider the volume and consider the size of the instruments as well, right? If you're doing like a, you know, a stand-up bass, for example, you're going to want to give that a lot of room. You want to find a space, you know, in between like the, the F holes and the actual string so you can get the resonance, but you can also get the string attack, those types of things. You want to keep in mind, you know, if you're miking up an instrument, it don't only consider the sound of the instrument, but consider the mechanics of it, you know, and, you know, what you actually, what part of it you actually want to capture. Um, yeah, and like I said, you don't, you want to capture the entire tone, not just boomy resonance. And then, yeah, multiple mics, you can blend them to kind of get cool, different, cool new tones, you know, recording two at once. But again, make sure the capsules are equidistant from the source. That's kind of the quickest way to avoid phase issues. Um, so just kind of check for that. <clears throat> Di let's see, dynamic for drums. How well, the thing is with drums, generally when you're miking up the kit, you're going to have your overheads that kind of, you know, cover everything or an overhead. Um, and then again, you know, some guys like to put condensers on Tom, some guys like to put dynamics, but generally, or some guys will put both. Um, but, uh, but yeah, like as far as that goes, that's placement where it's really the big thing to prevent bleed over from like one drum to the other. 
Well, actually, that, that that's that's part of the that's part of why I like dynamics for individual drum mics. Um, yeah, it's like I usually like you know like I use an SM57 or a 421. Yeah, the rejection. Those, exactly. So like you know you can get a lot more rejection because the like polar pattern of a dynamic mic is a lot tighter than it is than a condenser mic. Just in general, the way they're built, that's just sort of the way that they are. Mm -hmm. um, so it actually you allow it allows for a lot more rejection if you're using dynamic mics for like your snare and tom mics um, compared than compared with a condenser mic. Yeah, cool. Um, let's move on. So then speaker speaker cabinets. This is going to be more for you know for the for the guitar folks, um, but you know, or if you're recording guitar, electric guitars or bass or anything for that matter. This is going to be one of the most pronounced examples of your mic placement affecting your recorded tone. Um, you know, if you're sticking a mic on a guitar ramp and, you know, you move it from, you, if you've got it directly on the center of the cone and then you move that mic over like half an inch, because it's so close to the source and because the source is so loud and just because of the general inherent shape of it, immediately that's going to change your whole tone. Um, so that's something to be super aware of. Um, generally in this case, if you're, if you, again, if you're dialing up or if you're recording an amp, you want to get as your tone, you want to dial it up for the mic, not for the room. That's a big, big thing to keep in mind. So generally, you, especially if you're using like a 57, you're going to want to roll off a bunch of presents or a bunch of high end so it's not just all this super shrill garbage. Or again, that might be why you wanna like, you know, tilt the mic slightly off axis a little bit. So the capsule's not like directly just taking all of that, that sound pressure directly to the face and roll some of it off. Uh, guitar amp versus PA speaker. Like they sort of, the, the same principles apply here. It's basically just, you know, when you're sticking a mic on a speaker, you wanna consider you want to mic it for the or EQ it and prepare it for the microphone itself, not necessarily for the room. Um, but yeah, it, like, like like where you're listening to it, uh, uh, like you like you want it, you want to adjust your amp tone so that it sounds best when it's coming through your speakers or your headphones, as mm -hmm. opposed to like when you're physically in front of it. Yeah, because um, the microphone is going to color the the sound from the guitar amp significantly, and like your mic placement is also going to color the sound of the guitar. Of yeah. Significant. Uh, Josephine, I see your question there um, about an acoustic guitar that has a, a, a plug-in. Generally, as far as acoustics go, you're always going to want to just stick a mic on it. The DIs never sound good. Yeah, it's 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 pretty rare that I found an acoustic guitar DI that's like, oh my god, this sounds great. It's like, nah, it's you. They're usually a, if you just stick a mic in front of it, it's going to sound way better. Yeah, because those again, basically all of the pickup, all it is is a tiny mic inside the guitar, that's like the size of a P. So it's going to be, you know, a very it's a little bit of a thin sort of tinny sound that doesn't really actually give you an accurate representation of the guitar's tone. Um, but that's a great question. <clears throat> um, yeah, so that's that's pretty much that for the actual kind of techniques part. Um, yeah, from now on, we'll just take a, we'll just take some more questions. Real quick, I just want to add. Yeah. I have one like little tip that's kind of cool for guitar recording is uh, is if you you know if you have like a, a you know a sheet in front so you can't actually see the cones of your amp. If you put a little flashlight and run it out oh, yeah. against the. Uh, uh, the piece of uh, fabric that's in front of his cones, you can kind of see the actual cone and then you can actually kind of move your mic around and kind of really get like, okay, where do I want this to be? Yes. You know, where do I want this mic to be based on the cone? Yeah, exactly. Cause that's, that's really, that's where it all is. Um, let's see, mic the keyboard, direct in or MIDI. That one, uh, that one's easy. Basically it's the question is, do you want to get the actual sound of the synth? Or do you want to use software synths or something like that generally? Um, or what kind of tone do you want? If you want to run, you know, run your synthesizer into a speaker cabinet and then mic that for a certain sound, you can do that. If you just want to get pure tone of the synthesizer, you can go direct in. Um, either one will work. That's one of those, another, another pure case of just sort of engineering being subjective. 
for the uh, uh, I can address the the piano question because if, it, if it's like um, uh, if it's like a sort of a classical music piece, um, especially when you have like multiple if you have multiple pianos, probably what I would do is I would set them up so that they're sort of able to play together, and then I would you would have uh, you know either one or a pair of mics on each piano somewhere around the lip. And then I would have a mic, a pair of mics that would be picking up sort of um, both pianos in the room. Um, that's a very, it's a very classical sort of way of, of recording. And when you're, you know, when you're listening to it, you really, the whole point is you have the, the mics that are in the room, that's the majority of your sound. And then you mix a little bit of the individual piano mics in just to get a little bit more presence. Um, that would be the yeah. way to do it. Yeah, the, the other thing to consider too, for certain sources, like, you know, especially stuff that covers a lot of physical space. So again, drum kits, pianos, and even some cases, like if you're gonna do, if you're doing something like a, like a xylophone or other sort of percussion, uh, keep in mind that you can also record things in stereo, right? So two, two mics at once, which you then, once they're recorded, or if you have a mixer, for example, um, well, you'll pan to the left and right. And those are two signals that work together to create a wider sound. And yeah, that kind of covers the dish uh, for Josephine, the difference between stereo and mono. Mono is a single, is a single channel. It's one signal. Um, and that generally, you know, within the mix, you can kind of just put it anywhere because it's one thing. Whereas stereo is, is two channels that are each their own thing kind of separate from each other but they ultimately kind of are all part of the same overall sound so like for example you know when you're listening to if you're listening to a rock album for example and you have guitars on both sides of your ears you're actually hearing it sounds like stereo because there's two channels but that's actually two mono recordings that have been panned <clears throat> Any tips to get big fat drum sounds in the Logic DAW? Well, that's a good uh, good lead off because we will be doing another one of these on mixing uh, down down the road. Um, but yeah, for now, that's that's pretty much it as far as today's content. But again, the the important thing is you know understand your needs, um, you know exactly what you plan to accomplish, uh, you know why you actually want to do it, and you know analyze your space and see what you've got, see what you want, and just know what you need to do before you really start diving into things. Because the more you, obviously, the more you prepare ahead of time and the more you understand what you need and plan to do ahead of time, that better, you know, it just is going to make the whole process easier. Um, skills are greater than gear. This could be considered a contentious one, but basically the idea behind that is ultimately knowing how to use your tools and un like, you know, understanding the thought processes behind, you know, why you'd want to do something in a certain way or why you'd want to use something in a certain way. The actual, the thinking is, you know, the, is what's really going to help take your skills to the next level. Um, and again, that's, that's the next point too, of understanding the critical thinking is more important than the processes, right? You're going to learn more from breaking down a process and being like asking why, why does this process or how, you know, how, how do, how do I want to think about it is going to be infinitely more useful to you than just, you know, looking up how to do it and just being, you know, seeing something that's just like, this is the way it's done. That's not helpful because that's just an arbitrary thing. You want to understand the principles. Um, and then experiment, right? Take as much time as you can uh, afford yourself to just mess around, try things out. And that's ultimately the best way to learn as far as this kind of stuff is just doing it and putting in the time to try things, to fail at things, and then, you know, learn how to kind of correct those and, and do better with them. But uh, yeah, that's, that's it for me. Willie, got any quick closing remarks? No, I mean, I think the key is, uh, again, like keep in mind that, you know, you can do a lot with what you have. The key is, you know, to really try to exhaust what you're able to have. Um, you know, really work, you know, if you have whatever mic you have, really try out different placements, really try out, you know, 
uh, see what you can think about and uh, or see what you can have around the house that might be able to like work as an absorber or different placements in the room to be able to kind of like, you know, avoid having too much roominess or different things like that. Um, you know, really the key is that, you know, you can always do more with what you have than you might imagine. So the key is to really be creative mm -hmm. and think about what you're able to do. Yeah, that's that's the that's a big thing. Engineering, as much as it is a technical skill set, it's just as creative. It's just as much of an art form as the music itself. Mm -hmm. And, you know, so approach it as such. Try things again. Try things that you don't think will work. Try things that you're just like, yeah, this could be cool. Just just give yourself, you know, give yourself every opportunity to to learn and to to just kind of find new ways to do things. And yeah, and you'll, you know, the more you do that, the better you'll get. But uh, yeah, as far as our content for today, that's pretty, that's pretty much it. Again, uh, you will receive an email afterwards that's got a, uh, a copy of, of the presentation, as well as another handout with just some more tips and tricks, um, as well as some other pretty cool, uh, pretty cool stuff to check out. But yeah. Uh, yeah, oh, Matt, thanks again to everyone for dropping in. Thank you for your questions. And um, yeah, thanks again to Will as well for, for joining today. Yeah, thanks for having me. Yeah, no problem. Again, I'm, uh, I'm Andrew Lanhorst. And uh, thanks, for, thanks for coming out. This has been NWC Webinars. Uh, have a great day, everyone.